Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Jim Rickards. He's been on this show a number of times before, um, and he's very well known as a New York Times bestseller. A bunch of books that he's written, uh, several of which that I have read, and uh, we want to talk to Jim about some of those uh, ideas that he's passed along over the years that now are seeming to come into fruition. Thanks for joining me today, Jim. Great to be with you, Jay. It's really good to have you with us. It's always a treat to have you, I might say. Uh, You know, we've titled today's topic, How Might This Latest China Virus, or let's say a Hunan virus, or COVID-19, impact the geopolitical and global monetary landscape? And that's something I'd certainly like to get your ideas about. But I've read several books that you've written in the past, like the, The Road to Ruin, The Death of Money, Currency Wars, and Aftermath, Aftermath being your latest. You discuss how the existing dollar-based fractional reserve monetary system is heading for the dustbin of history. In Aftermath, though, you talked about seven secrets of wealth preservation in the coming chaos, and certainly seems to be, while things maybe aren't chaotic yet, uh, seems to be the potential for that to take place. So unless you think that the uh, Hunan virus, uh, with that, that the cat is out of the bag and it's just too late to talk about those things, or... If it's too late to really get ready for chaos, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but uh, I'd like to to ask you that. Um, Do you think it's too late? Are there still things that people can do, or is this thing uh, coming unglued very rapidly? Um, There are things that you could have done six months or a year ago that would have left you better off today. Having said that, there are still plenty of things you can do that will leave you better off tomorrow. This uh, crisis uh, is far from over. We have a a double crisis. One is the uh, Wuhan virus, uh, which is still spreading, still killing people tragically. Um, Things seem to be getting a little better, although in the United States, although I have to say, you know, better is a relative term. There's still a lot of fatalities. But a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the fatalities appearing today are people who were infected two or three weeks ago. Uh, But in terms of new hospital admissions, that's going down. So hopefully this will get better and we'll start to see some significant progress by the middle of May. Uh, there's, by the way, there's some pretty good applied mathematical modeling behind that forecast that, that would say, and I know models are kind of out of favor these days, a lot of the, a lot of the models aren't very good, but uh, I, I don't, uh, people think I, I dislike models. Actually, I only dislike bad models. I like good ones. Um, and of course, the hard part is telling one from the other, but some of the best models suggest that this disease does run its course um, and that the May 15th kind of reopening of the United States, a lot of governors have subscribed to that, not all of them, but a lot, uh, will will happen as expected. It doesn't mean the, the virus goes away. It doesn't mean there aren't more infections and fatalities, but it, it, it gets a little bit under control, at least relative to where we've been. So that's the good news. The bad news is that the economic damage uh, has, is just beginning. Uh, we haven't even seen the statistics. I mean, we're not, we, we have some. We have some anecdotal evidence. We have weekly initial claims for unemployment. We know that uh, upwards of 30 million Americans have lost their jobs in the last uh, six weeks. And, and just to put that in perspective, that's about 20% of the entire workforce. Uh, so you're looking at numbers that are actually worse than the Great Depression. Um, I, I tell people, you know, you can't look at the 2008 financial crisis or even the, you know, the 2000 dot-com bust or the 1998 global financial crisis. None of those are, are good baselines for understanding what's happening now. Uh, you have to go back at least to 1929 and the Great Depression, maybe even further back, um, in some ways, you know, back to the, the 14th century and the Black Death. But uh, to, to put this in perspective, so uh, good news is the, the coronavirus is um, seeming to run its course, even though it's still out there. The bad news is that the economic damage has just begun, and it will be horrific, and it will last a very long time. So what that means, to answer your first question, is, yeah, there are still things you can do because markets have not fully uh, priced or adjusted for what's coming. Okay, well, I want to ask you about some of those. You had seven ideas that I thought were very, uh, many of them still apropos, and I'd like to, to get to talk about that. But before we go to that, I, one other question uh, that I have uh, concerning the existing dollar currency system. An article in Reuters this morning, uh, the president of Shanghai Gold Exchange, Wang Zhenyang, 
uh, called for a new super sovereign currency to offset the global dominance of the U.S. dollar, which he predicted would decline long term while gold prices continue to rally. He he cited several problems with the existing system. He said rising instability of the dollar, which he believes is going to occur. Uh, he says it can be used as a weapon against other currencies in other countries. In other words, the U.S. having the world's reserve currency has been, of course, using this against Russia, against Iran, other countries to freeze the other countries' assets. And I think there's been some talk recently about uh, doing that to the Chinese uh, once they find out if, in fact, uh, this uh, well, I, I, there's a lot of anger towards the Chinese right now, whether it's warranted or not. That's uh, you know, I don't know. You might have some opinions on that, but at least the point he's making is that the U.S. having the world's reserve currency can use it as a weapon and hurt a lot of countries, and uh, and they, you know, understandably, some other countries don't like that so much. He thinks that we need a neutral currency like gold, but he says there just isn't enough gold in the world to make that possible. Which I I think that's uh, not a good argument. But um, he basically saying we need a super sovereign currency that's that's not political. Uh, he didn't explain how we would get there, but I know that you've given a lot of thought to this. You've talked about the IMF um, and the possible uh, SDRs again as a step in that direction. Uh, but what are your thoughts right now? Because it seems to me what could be unleashed here could start to get people thinking seriously about what you've been talking about along these lines for a number of years. Well, I have been talking about it for a long time, going back to my first book, 2011, <clears throat> pardon me, um, called Currency Wars, and then yeah. I followed that thread through the death of money and uh, the chapter one of The Road to Ruin in 2016, talked about ICE-9, which is basically freezing all the accounts and exchanges. Uh, also in 2016, I had my book, The New Case for Gold, which uh, tried to uh, actually did blow up some of these myths about gold. So as far as... Um, our, our chairman, I take it of the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, mm -hmm. um, he wants a super sovereign currency. Well, we already have one. We've had it since 1969. It's called the Special Drawing Right. It's world money, uh, SDR for short, uh, Special Drawing Right. It's issued by the IMF. Uh, it can be printed, uh, in effect, by the IMF in unlimited quantities. They have a, you know, people know the Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. Well, the IMF has a printing press. They can print these SDRs um, and give them out to their members. So there's a very deep, uh, you know, theoretically unlimited uh, pool of liquidity uh, waiting in the wings. So, so that currency already exists. The idea that there's not enough gold to have, whether it's a strict gold standard or a gold reference or some use for gold in the monetary system is, is just wrong. Uh, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Right. Now, if you take the 33,000 official tons at today's market price of around, you know, $1,710 an ounce, give or take a little bit, um, and, it does, and it does bounce around. Uh, that's not enough money supply to support world trade or world commerce. But if you increase the price to ten thousand dollars an ounce, it is that that you know thirty three thousand tons times ten thousand dollars an ounce comes up to about uh, nine point four trillion, which would be forty percent. Sorry, nine point six trillion, which would be forty percent of the twenty four trillion um, M one money supply. So there's always enough gold. It's just a question of getting the price right. The, and so by raising the price, the same quantity of gold would support a much larger monetary system. Now, there's not one central banker in the world who wants to do that. There's probably not one PhD economist in the world who wants to do that. So I'm not saying that there's any support for this. But if you're, <clears throat> pardon me, if you're asking whether it's possible, um, it is possible. And we've been there before. We were on a gold standard in the past. Uh, SDRs have been around, by the way, since 1969. There's nothing new about them. Uh, they were not issued for um, 30 years, between 1980 and 2009, almost 30 years, 29 years. Um, there was an issue in 2009. I think I might have been the only one who noticed. Um, but it wasn't that big. It was about $250 billion equivalent. But there is talk today um, uh, among members of the IMF, among prominent economists, that, yeah, now's the time to do a big issue. Um, the Financial Times has suggested about $1.3 trillion equivalent, or you know, roughly uh, $1 trillion SDRs. Do it now. Hand it out to the members. Uh, and then they can actually take those SDRs, every country. Because every country would get some. There are 188 members. They would all get some according to their quotas. It would be pro rata. Um, then they can take those SDRs, 
put them in a special purpose vehicle and then leverage them up 10 to 1 so they'd be issuing new debt using those SDRs as a capital cushion. So it would be like uh, 188 banks, I guess, and you could buy all those bonds. So you, you could do that fairly easily. Fairly easily. Um, mm-hmm. It's not going to happen, uh, and here's why. The United States has veto power at the IMF. You need 85% of the votes at the IMF to do anything of this significance. The United States uh, keeps about uh, has about a 17% vote. Uh, so in other words, and that's not a coincidence, by the way, that's enough to veto anything because if the U.S. says no, then all the other members combined if, can only get to 83%. They can't get to 85%. Why does the U.S. not want to issue SDRs right now? Well, this is... Uh, this is uh, the answer is political, uh, and again, our chairman of the Shanghai Stock Exchange says, you know, I'd like a super sovereign currency that's not political. Well, good luck with that. All currencies, <laughs> all currencies are political because they're controlled by governments. Um, and uh, but but the U.S. would stop it. But here's why: if you did what I just described, uh, say a trillion SDRs handed out to the members, China would get some, and Iran would get some, and the United States is completely opposed to any financial assistance to China or Iran. So we will say no, not for economic reasons, but for geopolitical reasons, because we don't want the Iranians to get any uh, any relief, and we don't want the Chinese to get any relief. Mm. Well, um, Jim, this is the way the structure is now at the, at the IMF. Uh, the U.S. has all those votes. What could threaten that? Well, the IMF, every uh, five years, they do what they call a quota review, and they think about you know perhaps increasing the shares of certain members but i think and that's there's one underway now it's kind of a rolling review um but even when they decide on recommended quotas executive order recommends quotas you still have to go back to the members and get it approved and so the last time they were they were trying to get something done in um uh, i think 2010 uh there was a 2010 quota review and it took uh, until um, you know, years later to actually get it done. So, uh, so it's not a quick process. But again, the U.S. has veto power over that, uh, and um, I'm, I'm quite sure the U.S. would not allow its percentage to go under 15 percent. In other words, if China was going to get more, and they might because they're they they're they're a bigger part of the global economy. So in theory, they deserve a bigger quota. They'll take it away from Belgium or the Netherlands or somebody, you know, Norway or somebody, but they won't take it away from the United States. So, um, so other members can get more with these quota reviews. They don't happen quickly. They don't happen often. And the U.S. can stand in the way. So again, the U.S. has pretty good blocking power when it comes to the IMF. So you don't see any changes there in, in the foreseeable future. You think it's status quo for the dollar. The dollar gets weaker. Uh, what, well, how should we look at it as investors going forward? It's a really good question because people talk all the time about the, the dollar getting stronger and the dollar getting weaker as if they knew what they were talking about. And, <laughs> and the question is, what do you compared to what? Yeah. Um, so most for most people, I mean, seriously, for there are three main indices people use. One is DXY or Dixie, which is a futures contract, and that's a currency basket. Um, there's the Bloomberg has an index again, another currency basket, and they publish that. And then the Fed has one. That's the one I use. It's called the Broad a Real Trade Weighted Index, and uh, and and I use that in in my own research. And they will all show you know the dollar getting stronger, or weaker, but it's always compared to other currencies, mainly the euro, not exclusively. You know, you got the yen and uh, pound sterling and a couple other currencies in there, but it's mostly the euro U.S. dollar cross rate. And so everyone says, well, we want to, um, you, know, you know, so by those measures, yes, the dollar is strong. But the problem is all the currencies together are like passengers in a lifeboat. You know, the Titanic sank. Um, these people got in a lifeboat. They have no food, no water. Now you can go around the passengers and say, hey, you're, you're a little stronger than this guy or you're taller than uh, he is or she's taller than somebody else. Um, so you can make comparisons, but you miss the bigger picture, which is you're all in the same boat. Um, if you want to think about whether currencies are getting stronger or weaker, you have to compare them to gold. Ask yourself, how much is an ounce of gold denominated in whatever currency it is? And that's your best metric. And the reason is because um, gold is not um, – it's not a – it's a form of money for sure, but it's not issued by a central bank. It's not subject to you know massive 
uh, trillion dollar uh, printing exercises, etc. So what's going on right now? Well, the dollar is strong against the euro and the yen and emerging market currencies. That's true, but it's getting weaker relative to gold. So if you ask me, is the dollar getting stronger or weaker? I would say it's clearly getting weaker, but it's important to understand my my measuring stick or yardstick is a little different than most people's because gold is the only objective measure of a currency strength. No, that's uh, no doubt about it, which then brings me to uh, your uh, seven secrets uh, in your in your last book. And one of those was uh, number six was prepare for assets backed currencies with physical gold. Um, so I guess that's what obviously that's what people should do. And if you think uh, I mean, do you think you mentioned $10,000 is what we would need? What What is your outlook for gold, Jim, right now? Well, yeah, I mean, it's. It's not that gold it gains any value. It's that the currencies continue to depreciate that, relative to gold. Right? That's, the, that's the point. And so you know, the strong dollar talk um, is, is it's either nonsense or you know, you're comparing it to other currencies. Uh, but the dollar is actually getting a lot weaker by the day because the dollar price of gold is going up. So um, w- here's another thing most people haven't really tuned into, Jay. We're in the third grade bull market in history for gold. Uh, The reason I say that, prior to 1971, as far back as the 1870s, but you can go as far back as, uh, you know, uh, two or 3,000 B.C., um, there was no gold standard. I mean, gold was money. Uh, You walked around with it. You had gold sovereigns. You put them in a purse and put it in the safe and took it to India with you, and you got there, and it was money good. Now, since... um, uh, the 1870s going forward, yes, there was a there were different kinds of gold standards, three different ones. One broke up around 1914. One uh, lasted through the 20s and 30s, and then the Bretton Woods after 1944. Uh, but it wasn't until 1971 that you really had a free market in gold because uh, you know when gold when you're on a gold standard, the price of gold doesn't change. That's the whole idea of a gold standard. I always run into gold fans or gold bugs or whatever you call them and they say you know they bang the table and say i want a gold standard and say well be careful what you wish for because you won't make any money on a gold standard because it means the price is fixed the time to make money is when you don't have a gold standard and you can actually as an individual go out and buy gold in the free market and benefit from the appreciation so so you start in 1971 So the first bull market went from 1971 to January 1980, and gold went up 2,600%. It went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. The second bull market went from August 1999 to August 2011. Gold went up 670%. It went from $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. Now, you had some bear markets. So, 1980 to 1999 was it was a long, drawn-out, slow bear market where gold fell from $800 to 250 Then you had another bear market, much sharper and, and faster, from 2011 to 2015, where gold fell from $1,900 an ounce to $1,050 an ounce. But... You can pinpoint the you can pinpoint the end of that bear market. It was December sixteenth, two thousand fifteen. Gold was one thousand fifty dollars an ounce. It had fallen if you work off the two hundred fifty dollar base from nineteen ninety nine. It had fallen fifty percent. And I had a conversation once with Jim Rogers. I'm sure you know, with sure. one of the most famous commodities traders of all time. And he said to me, he said, Jim, nothing. We both see gold going much higher. But he said, Jim, nothing goes to the moon in commodities without a 50% retracement along the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, got it. That makes sense. Well, we've had that. When when gold went from $1,900 uh, off a of 250 base down to $1,050, that's a 50% retracement, almost to the penny. Uh, so that's behind us. And then the third bull market began. Now, since December 16, 2015, gold is up over 70%. You know, $1,050 an ounce to $1,710 an ounce. So it's up 70% in the last five years, and or four, it's four and a half years. And people say to me, Jim, when's, when's the bull market in gold going to start? And I said, well, it's, <laughs> it, it, started, it started four years ago. It's just that sentiment was so bad, people were so discouraged, and they were so beaten down by the bear market that they failed to notice that we were in a new bull market. Now, so you've missed four years of, of gains, and, and we're up 70%. Having said that, 
Um, I expect gold to be at um, ten thousand. Sorry, uh, fourteen thousand dollars an ounce by twenty twenty five. Now that's just as simple. I say, what's the model for that? Because I don't make these things up. That's a simple average of the last two bull markets. So the first bull market lasted nine years. The second bull market lasted twelve years. So just take the average of nine and twelve, and you get ten and a half. So ten and a half forward from two thousand fifteen gets you out to two, uh, you know, twenty twenty five. And then take the gains, you know, 2,600% and 670% um, and average them and they come out around 1,400%. Mm-hmm. So that would put gold at $14,000 an ounce by, you know, late 2025. That's not right. uh, So, but my point is it could be $2,000 an ounce by early 2021. So this, okay. this thing still has a long way to go. All right. Very good. Jim, we'll have to leave it go at that. We're out of time already. It's un- unfortunate. Uh, so much more to ask you, but do you have any books coming out? Any new, anything new you might be writing soon? Well, uh, yeah, I'm working on a book actually on what we've been talking about. The well, uh, the, you know, the the new depression. Uh, it'll be out in uh, July. I'll have a, a lot more to say about it when we get a little closer to the publication date. But I'm actually working on that book now. But my book okay. after aftermath, which came out last November, I think is still very timely in terms of preparing for what's going to come. Excellent. Very good. Thank you so much, Jim, for being with us. 